central banks are a tremendous danger. They are all heads of a criminal organization. Danger. 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 Democratic states are deterioration. The democratic equality before the law is something completely incompatible with the idea of one universal law applying to every person in exactly the same way. Everyone can become king, so to speak. So to speak. So to speak. So to speak. It exists in the form of the difference between a higher public law that applies to public officials and a lower private law that applies to regular folks. Under democracy, everyone is equal in so far as entry into government is open to all on equal terms. If as a private person, I simply take your money out of your wallet, this is considered to be a criminal offense and I will be punished. If as a public official, I come to you and do exactly the same thing, this falls under public law, is considered to be a legal activity. So to speak. If there's a private law, I take you and beat you up and force you to work for me day and night. This would be considered kidnapping, slavery and whatever, and is of course a great offense. If I do that as a public official, then it is called public service military draft, and things like this is perfectly all right. Everyone can engage in theft and live off stolen loot if only he becomes the public official. Hey, it's Jose Galison. You're watching No Way Jose. You can find me on No Way Jose YouTube channel, all the major auto podcasters and Odyssey as well. Uh, that intro, uh, once again, I've been using these. I, I told you in the last one, uh, I'm gonna st I found this page, Romero Synth on YouTube. I don't know if maybe he puts it out elsewhere. Uh, he's got these cool like Hoppa synth type stuff. Uh, it's pretty dope. So I'll be kind of using those alternate, al like alternating between the ones he has for these. I think there's like four or five of them. So uh, they are a little long, so I warned you in the last episode. If you don't like it, I, I don't know, fast forward. Uh, but uh, I think they're dope, and it sets a nice tone. So, uh, but yeah, you always, always have that little fast forward. Uh, you can also fast forward this little intro part that I usually do at the beginning. Just letting you guys know. Uh, my guest today is Toad. We are continuing our live reading of uh, Democracy of the God That Failed. We are on Chapter 2 now. Uh, I do want to let you guys know, if you're the, the whole shtick, if you're watching this on the 17th, it's a you're watching the live stream. Uh, the way this works is uh, about almost immediately after the stream, I will take it down and it will go behind a paywall. So if you want to be able to have access to it in the meantime, it's public right now if you're watching the live stream. But if you want to be able to have access to it in the meantime, you need to be a patron at patreon.com. It's no way Jose 2020. The lowest level just for that to get that, uh, you know, be able to watch it while it's behind the paywall, that's two bucks. It's a $5 level, $10 level, and there's a $20 level as well. Uh, the $20 level is the sponsors. I read them off every episode. I have um, Mikel Thorpe of the Expat Money Show. Uh, he's if you want to get the hell out of the country, he's your guy. Uh, he's got a, a podcast. He also does it as a business, so you can check out either. Uh, I have Jeremy, who has an Etsy at etsy.com slash shop slash raising liberty. Uh, you also follow me at jeremyrhymes.com. He has a lot of liberty type merch if that's something you're looking for. Uh, and then I also have Toad, who is my guest today. Uh, you know, he's my co host as well on Tower Power Hour. So, uh, yeah, definitely go check him out and check out Tower Power. If you're into, like, offensive comedy, if you're a little bit of a degenerate, uh, go check that out. That'll be your thing. 
Uh, that's another show I do with Toad, uh, Top Lobster, Reed Coverdale, Clint uh, Russell, and Fat Dave. Uh, he's, he's now Fat Dave again. So th those are the guys. Uh, yeah, I do also want to let you guys know, like I mentioned, Top Lobster. You go to toplobster.com. You suppose they get checkout if you want to get some of my merch. You also get Tower Power merch. You can get uh, Natural Capitalist merch, Liberty Lockdown merch, plenty of, a bunch of other shows as well. Also, he has stuff that's not uh, show-related. So he has other, other merch. Uh, definitely go check him out. He's the man. Uh, we all love him. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and get Toad in here. Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, what's up? The hey, Federal dude. Reserve is a danger. Yeah, let's dude, I, I think that might be my favorite one, dude. Yeah, that one's oh, dope. Yeah. Dude, that does slap. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It kind of gets me excited. I'm like, oh, we're about to read some Hoppa. Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if you have any other any any little small talk for us before we get into it, I, I, or also I, just, we can I, just dig right into it. What's I like up? how you almost forgot about uh, Fat Dave's existence there for a second. Yeah, I, I totally <laughs> almost forgot him. And then when, when I realized at the end that I almost forgot him, I thought for a split moment, just don't mention him because it's funnier that way. <laughs> I thought you might go that route. I don't know. I was like, what's going on here? Yeah, but it's a, it's a joke without a real payoff because I feel like he he's not going to watch this. So. <laughs> he doesn't read. He's definitely yeah. – if he watches it, it will be for a second to come in and just make fun of your viewer count. Yeah. So – uh yeah and he's definitely not gonna watch what's gonna end up probably being like a 20 part series but with that you know <laughs> people out there if you enjoy this share it around because uh uh usually the usually when you have these type of series that have multiple uh, uh episodes to them usually they really start to die off if they're too long this one's gonna be like 20 parts so help a brother out share it around uh this is something i want to do anyway so i'm gonna do it either way but still yeah. It is kind of shitty. You're like, ah, shit. <laughs> like, <look at> me. <laughs> the views <laughs> die off with each subsequent one. I'm like, you fuckers, you, you don't. No, want to no. Like the, the, this book, uh, some of it gets better as it goes. So uh, yeah, it really some does. of these later chapters are bangers in this one because yeah. he gets into really shitting on the Democrats and the left, basically. So <laughs> my favorite stuff. Well, all right, man. You ready to get into it? I believe we're in chapter two now. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to do uh, the first half of chapter two, uh, which yep. is on monarchy, democracy, and the idea of natural order. So yep. he is going to be rehashing some of the points that he's already made because uh, he wants all of these chapters to kind of be standalone as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he could, yeah, so you, it is like you are kind of catching some of the stuff from previous things. Which uh, I guess that means we'll maybe have a little bit less commentary on these ones. We'll see. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll. Uh, I mean, either way. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, but a lot of books write like this. They'll, they'll really like rehash stuff over and over again. Because I mean, anyone's done any sports or really just anything that's like a, even with reading, it's like. I mean, how many times do you have to do something before you get it down? And the same thing goes with like intellectual pursuits. You gotta got to really you know, rehash the point in multiple different angles before it really sinks in. It's just like I was uh, I, I listened to part of the problem for years before I considered myself an anarchist. And like he would make these great points and mm -hmm. uh, it, but it wasn't until I read Anami Estate that I was like, "Oh, like I don't know, it just takes like a million different ways for you like, okay, all right, you know, before it finally sets in. Yeah, I, I did the whole uh, cliche 6 months thing and it was a combination of watching part of the problem uh, for that entire period mm -hmm. and reading Anatomy of the State around the same time. So that's it, that's what did it. It really clicked in when I actually started reading. <laughs> so like, Because I would just listen to podcasts a lot. And then I was like, you know, I'm going to start reading some of this content. And that's when it really started cl clicking in. I listened to it for years. But something yeah. about reading just really reinforces it. But all right, let's get into it. Uh, on monarchy, democracy, and the idea of natural order. Yeah, and uh, I figured we could like – possibly repeat similar commentary if uh, yeah. if it comes up because some people you know might want to watch these episodes as a standalone like he yeah. had intended these chapters to be so we could do that yeah no obviously if you have commentary uh you know feel free to stop me or or whenever we pause between paragraphs bring it up even if it's something we've hashed over again i'm not gonna lie it's kind of hard to redo commentary i've already done because i just feel like i'm like rehashing conversation but uh you know if it's natural we'll see, we'll see what happens uh, let's get into it. Theory, the comparative economics of private and public ownership, uh, public government ownership. A government is a territorial monopolist of compulsion, an agency which may engage in continual institutionalized property rights violations and exploitation in the form of expropriation, taxation, and regulation of private property owners. Assuming no more than self-interest on the part of government agents, all governments must be expected to make use of this monopoly and exhibit a tendency towards increased exploitation, which I underline that because I think 
this is one of those things that like doesn't really click in for a lot of people because it's like just the very existence of government you know uh kind of, kind of like presumes the expansion of government because it's just what it does um so i mean they're a monopoly they, they have a monopoly in this given thing like they're going to expand they have there's no incentive otherwise um, right it's interesting because like especially people on the left tend to be totally on board with the fact that hey everybody's selfish but then they that somehow leads them to the thought of that's why we need to tax everybody and then give that all to these other people who are still going to be something it's like that selfishness just doesn't apply anymore to the the people who are in government even though they tend to be the most selfish among us so and of course uh there's a difference between self-interest and selfishness so if you're just assuming that everybody works in their own self-interest uh you can determine uh just from observation as hoppa just described right there that these people are going to be working to enrich themselves essentially so it, it's going to lead to increased amounts of exploitation however not every form of government can be expected to be equally successful in this endeavor or to go about it in the same way rather in light of elementary economic theory the conduct of government and the effects of government policy on civil society can be expected to be systematically different depending on whether the government apparatus is owned privately or publicly the defining characteristic of private government ownership is that the expropriated resources and the monopoly privilege of future expropriation are individually owned. The appropriated resources are added to the ruler's private estate and treated as if they were a part of it. And the monopoly's privilege of future export expropriation is attached as a title to this estate and leads to an instant increase in its present value. More importantly, a private owner of the government estate the ruler is entitled to pass his possessions on to his personal heir. He may sell, rent, or give away part or all of his privileged estate and privately pocket the receipts from the sale or rental, and he may personally employ or dismiss every administrator employee of his estate. I'm getting into that. We're just rehashing stuff we did in previous previous stuff. I mean, there's a yeah. lot there. He's going. He's he's definitely mm. speed speeding through the content that we've covered already. Right. Uh, so again, so. he's he's bringing up yeah the contra. He's about to contrast this and talk about uh, publicly owned or democratic governments. He's contrasting that with what he calls privately owned governments, which are monarchies. Which I think a better way to look at it is that the monarchy is uh, closer to uh, mimicking a private scenario, even though it's not entirely private but because it's owned by basically just very few people a single family or something like that that it tends to operate more like a private entity than anything else so it's much closer yeah. to being a private ownership scenario yeah and ironically it's actually closer to what minarchists claim they want because <laughs> like the idea of a government that stays constrained and even then uh, yeah. Hoppe would say, and he has said in this book, they don't stay constrained. That's the whole reason why, to some extent, they become democracies or, you know, uh, they've essentially transformed. And, you know, it is natural for them to expand. They just expand less. Yeah. And those so, minarchists yeah. are just one typo away from being based, man. There's yes. one, one key away, just one slip mm -hmm. of the, uh, the finger there. Yep. In contrast with a publicly owned government, the control over the government apparatus lies in the hands of a trustee or caretaker. The caretaker may use the apparatus to his personal advantage, but he does not own it. He cannot sell government resources and privately pocket the receipts, nor can he pass government possessions onto his personal heir. He owns the current use of government resources, but not their capital value. Moreover, while entrance into the position of a private owner of government is restricted by the owner's personal discretion, entrance into the position of a caretaker slash ruler is open. Anyone in principle can become the government's caretaker. Uh, essentially, in in a public one, you can you can look at it as they uh, they essentially uh, are able to wait like minimize. They basically don't take on any of the losses, and they're able to take on some of the uh, gains that comes from being in in some sort of charge of the government. You know, so right, yeah. Uh, he he's just again, yeah, repeating uh, the fact that uh, in a publicly owned government or democratic government, the people that are in power are temporary caretakers and they're going to be incentivized to just maximize their self-interest over that short period of time just to enrich themselves essentially whereas in the case of a monarchy it may be more uh they may be the monarchist may be more incentivized to keep things in order to pass them down to his heir so he may be more incentivized to save and be more future oriented than the temporary uh democratic caretakers would be 
From these assumptions, two central interrelated predictions can be deduced. One, a private government owner will tend to have a systematically longer planning horizon, i.e. his uh, degree of time preference will be lower, and accordingly his degree of economic exploitation will tend to be less than that of a government caretaker. And two, subject to a higher degree of exploitation, the non-governmental public will also be comparatively more present-oriented under a system a publicly owned government than under a regime of private government ownership. This is where he just starts tying in his uh, time preference concept in here a little bit more. Right. Uh, yeah. He, he applies the time preference uh, idea throughout this whole thing. Right. And again, uh, the democratic system of government is just going to heighten the time preference. I like how he put it in that paragraph, not only of the agents of the government, but the public as well, because the government is, uh, you know, stealing more from them, um, expropriating more from them, and just all of the incentives get shifted way more in that type of scenario so that the public will become uh, a much, uh, like their their time preference will be uh, way higher than it would be in, uh, with a monarchy. Yep. Essentially. One, a private government owner will predictably try to maximize his total wealth, i.e. the present value of his estate and his current income. He will not want to increase his current income at the expense of a more than proportional drop in the present value of his assets. Essentially, he this this thing he has has value. It's the same idea as having a house or something, and so he doesn't want to reduce the value of his of his thing of his house in order to I don't know some sort of temporary gain, uh, or at least you know he may weigh that a little bit more than a caretaker would. Um, right. Do 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 do. And because acts of current income acquisition invariably have repercussions on present asset values, uh, private ownership in and of itself leads to economic calculation and thus promotes farsightedness. I would say, uh, real quick on that, I, I guess it sort of leads to economic calculation, but not like perfect economic calculation because he would probably agree that in a free society you would actually have true economic calculation – Mm -hmm. uh the the i would say a private government as he would say would still kind of fuck with it to some extent but not near as much as a public government yeah um, i would agree with that yeah yeah uh, do, 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 do. in the case uh in the case of uh, the private ownership of government this implies a distinct moderation with respect to the ruler's incentive to exploit his monopoly privilege of expropriation for acts of expropriation are by their nature parasitic upon prior acts of production on the part of the non-governmental public. Where nothing has first been produced, nothing can be expropriated. And where everything is expropriated, all future production will come to a shrieking halt. Uh, I mean, we use words like expropriated and stuff there, but this is actually a very simple concept that is also weirdly kind of, um, I don't want to say deep, but uh, profound in a, even in its yeah. simplicity. Because it's like things have to be created uh, in order to be able to take shit from them, and right. if everything is taken from them, then you can't. You, you're not. You don't have the goods to be able to do future production. So, um, accordingly, a private government owner will want to avoid exploiting his subjects so heavily, for instance, as to reduce his future earnings potential to such an extent that the present value of his estate actually falls. Instead, in order to preserve or possibly even enhance the value of his personal property, he will systematically restrain himself in his exploitation policies. For the lower the degree of exploitation, the more productive the subject population will be. And the more productive the population, the higher will be the value of the a ruler's parasitic monopoly of expropriation. He will use a monopolistic privilege, of course. He will not, exp he will not, not exploit. But as the government's private owner, it is in his interest to draw parasitically on a growing, increasingly productive and prosperous non-government economy as this would effortlessly also increase his own wealth and prosperity. And the degree of exploitation thus would tend to be low. Yeah. I don't know if you have to add to that before we move on. No, a I, lot there. Uh, it's all – it's almost verbatim stuff that he said in uh, Chapter 1 as well. So, right, he's, he's just saying that, yeah, the – uh, monarchy is still going to do the bad things that a democracy would do, but to a much lesser extent. Yeah. Moreover, private ownership of government implies moderation and farsightedness for yet another reason. All private property is by definition exclusive property. He who owns property is entitled to exclude everyone else from its use and enjoyment. 
and he is at liberty to choose with whom, if anyone, he is willing to share in his usage. I do like that he, he pointed at, like, he's all private properties by definition exclusive property. And obviously, we've explained this before. A quote unquote private government is not really a private government. I guess, in a sense, it's a government that's sort of privately owned, but it's not in a true sense of ownership. But the right. point he's making is that they are they are the one who have uh, the exclusive uh, quote unquote rights, or at least perceived rights, to the usage of this thing, and that is what private, in a certain sense, that is what uh, ownership of a of a thing is. Like, so if you have a thing and you aren't able to uh, exercise full control over it, you don't really own it. Like, I mean, maybe you could say there's some sort of partial owner, but yeah, like the idea of public property is kind of a contradiction in terms um yeah it, yeah right uh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the uh tragedy of the commons yep. type of situation yeah we're uh you you essentially uh people just uh see it as being unowned even though it's not really unowned and that uh of course the government uh, is exercising their authority over it and then it just becomes really muddled and hard to determine well who are the actual rightful owners of this shit yeah typically he will include his family and exclude all others except as an invited guests or as paid employees or contractors only the ruling family and to a minor extent its friends employees and business partners share in the enjoyment of the expropriated resources and can thus lead a, a parasitic life because of these restrictions regarding entrance into government and the exclusive status of the individual ruler and his family private government ownership stimulates the development of a clear class consciousness on the part of the non-government public and promotes the opposition and resistance to any expansion of the government's exploitative power. A clear-cut distinction between the few rulers on the one hand and the many ruled on the other exists, and there is little risk or hope of anyone of either class ever falling or rising from one class to the other. Confronted with an almost insurmountable barrier in the way of upward mobility, the solidarity among the ruled, their mutual identification as actual or potential victims of government property rights violations is strengthened, and the risk to the ruling class of losing its legitimacy as a result of increased exploitation is heightened. Uh, once again, this is my one of me and you's probably favorite point in this whole book is the class conscious aspect. But go ahead, you're going to see Yeah, um, it's two points that he has made before. He makes throughout this book that I think are sort of the two like key points in the whole book. One is the class consciousness thing, where in the um, monarchical situation, it's much more obvious who the ruling class are and who the ruled are, so the ruling class can get away with less. And then the other point that he's making here is that um, in that type of situation, it's also way harder for anybody from the public to actually move, move into the ruling class, move yeah. from the uh, ruled to the ruling. So that distinction is, yeah, is made there. And people don't see themselves as, hey, I could actually get into this. I could become one of these powerful people. Whereas in the democracy, it's like, you know, the we are, we rule ourselves, essentially the government of the people, whatever, where everybody sees themselves as somebody who could do that. So then you lose that aspect of it where you think you're ruling yourself and uh, people that want to achieve that level of power will like, definitely uh, go for it and will be able to uh, do that uh, more than they would be able to in the uh, monarchy. Yep. And I guess I would say that in that paragraph, he's kind of saying, he's talking about how there's kind of that like barrier to entry there, but he's not talking about class as far as like, like maybe a Marxist would look at it as far as He's not saying that people wouldn't be able to rise up and like acquire wealth and get richer. Like that's more likely if you have a smaller government, like a monarchy here. What he's just uh, he's making the distinction between the ruling and the ruled, which I think that 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 was like the biggest flaw with Marx. Or I think Hoppe actually makes this point that Marx was actually correct in that there is a uh, bourgeois bourgeoisie and a proletariat basically, but he misidentified who those actors are and that it's really the ruling uh versus the ruled rather than like the rich versus the poor or anything yeah. uh you know more along those lines i guess yeah, I would there, say. there's definitely a uh, i wish i could remember the, the name of it but there is a very good speech he has it's on you can definitely find it on youtube and stuff where he talks about this i don't think he's ever written extensively that i know of on it i mean i'm sure maybe it's like showed up in bits of his books i don't think he's wrote like a book on that topic 
but he has definitely had speeches or a, a, a very prominent speech on the topic where he, he does, you know, kind of be like, hey, Marx had a lot of good points. And he kind of compares and contrasts Marx's yeah. idea with like kind of, you know, libertarianism and stuff like that. Um, yeah. All right. In distinct contrast, the caretaker of a publicly owned government will try to maximize not total government wealth, but current income. Uh, indeed, even if the caretaker wishes to act differently, he cannot, for as public property government resources are unsaleable, and without market prices, economic calculation is impossible. Accordingly, it must be regarded as unavoidable that public government ownership will result in continual capital consumption. Instead of maintaining or even enhancing the value of the government estate, as a private owner would tend to do, the government's temporary caretaker will quickly use up as much of the government's resources as possible. For what he does not consume now, he may never be able to consume. In particular, a caretaker, as distinct from a government's private owner, has no interest in not ruining his country. For why would he not want to increase his exploitation? If the advantage of a policy of moderation, the resulting higher capital value of the government's estate, cannot be reaped privately, while the advantage of the opposite policy of increased exploitation, a higher current income, can be so reaped. To a caretaker, unlike to a private owner, moderation only ha has only disadvantages. Right. So that's kind of the same point again where, yeah, when you have temporary caretakers of government, they have no uh, incentive to save any of that. So it's just consume, consume, and their actions also cause the public to behave in that manner as well, where, as we see, and a lot of it does have to do with the Federal Reserve, uh, keeping interest rates uh, way lower than they would be otherwise, just constantly uh, incentivizing uh, spending and borrowing rather than saving. Yep. Um, and I guess, yeah, he, he mentions the economic calculation uh problem as well here, which I think the one thing I would say about that is that, it, yes, you, you were correct that yeah, in a monarchy, um, economic calculation might be like messed with a little bit, but it's still like possible because I think you still are seeing that like all these industries still exist and they haven't been like taken over or nationalized. Whereas in the like more democratic system, that's what tends to happen where the entire industry gets taken over, like healthcare, um, yeah. you know, uh, college student yeah, feel, loans all of that shit like yeah. it, you you can't properly price anything in those industries anymore because they've been completely taken over by government yeah i feel like a lot of people look at economic calculation as like a binary but really i think it should, it's more like a spectrum and that's kind of the point i was getting at mm. like in a true free society i guess you would have perfect uh theoretically perfect uh uh economic calculation and then the, the complete opposite like a full-on you know uh like uh communist tyranny type situation or something like that where they're they're controlling all prices then you have none you have no economic calculation i mean i guess you could even right. then you can make a case there's some maybe maybe you can make some sort of case there's some sort of semblance of it i don't know but yeah it's definitely there's degrees of it just like uh you know in in our, with agoras <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> exactly um but all right yeah it's on to you your your, your turn to read let's uh, yeah. let's get this bread in addition, with a publicly owned government, anyone in principle can become a member of the ruling class or even the supreme power. The distinction between the rulers and the ruled, as well as the class consciousness of the ruled, become blurred. So again, he's making that same point again that we just talked about. The illusion even arises that the distinction no longer exists, that with a public government, no one is ruled by anyone, but everyone instead rules himself. Accordingly, Public resistance against government power is systematically weakened. While exploitation and expropriation before might have appeared plainly oppressive and evil to the public, they seem much less so. Mankind being what it is, once anyone may freely enter the ranks of those who are at the receiving end. Consequently, not only will exploitation increase, whether openly in the form of higher taxes or discreetly as an increased governmental money creation, inflation, or legislative regulation. Likewise, the number of government employees, public servants, will rise absolutely as well as relatively to private employment, in particular attracting and promoting individuals with high degrees of time preference and limited farsightedness. Yeah, so I do like a lot of those points that he uh, is making there. Um, yeah, I mean, he mentions the money creation aspect of it, like I was just uh, mentioning. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's just the same points that he kind of made before, but he likes to hammer those things 
home with the, uh, yeah, it just makes it with the monarchy. It's way more obvious that the ruled are being ruled. So they'll tend to push back on that a lot more than in the situation where the lines are totally blurred and you think that you are ruling yourself essentially, then you won't really be pushing back on that. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, the government will, those, uh, the government expands, so more and more people will join uh, that class, and it will tend to attract the people that have higher degrees of time preference, like he's saying. Um, you know, that's how the incentives will line up. In contrast to the right of self-defense, in the event of a criminal attack, the victim of government violations of private property rights may not legitimately defend himself against such violations. So that's another point that he's made before where... Um, I don't know if I would use definitely like necessarily use the word uh, legitimate there, but yeah. um, like everything the government does is illegitimate, but like it's not going to be legal for you to defend yourself yeah. against the government's actions. So that's what the problem is there. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's a, we've talked about this before. I, I don't know if it's a language barrier and, or even a mix of things where it's like, he doesn't want to caveat everything because right. if he had to caveat, because, because you can understand how it's way more unwieldy to write down like <laughs> he may not uh, or, or to have to explain every time he says like legitimately defend. He means like in the eyes of, you know, the nor like in, in the right. collective uh, eyes of the, the collective consciousness or some shit like that, you know, like uh, th that would be way too much of a hassle. So but I do think it's it's a good point to to bring up again because you know the the whole idea right. from a libertarian perspective is that yeah you can morally do it it just may not end up well for you <laughs> like, right again yeah legality is not the same thing as morality yeah. and yeah while you can i mean even now you might not even be able to legally or legitimately uh, defend yourself against other private actors too as we're seeing in some of these cities with like that jose aldo guy or whatever who's defending his uh bodega and i think i don't know what wound up happening to him but i know they were trying to punish him uh, criminally in some way for that. Yeah, I think that fell through. I mean, I didn't really follow it. I think he got out, but I don't know. All right, uh, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's uh, the, the imposition of a government tax on property or income violates a property owner's uh, violates a property owner's and income producer's rights as much as theft does. In both cases, the owner-producer's supply of goods is diminished against his will and without his consent. Government money or liquidity creation involves no less a fraudulent expropriation of private property owners than the operations of a criminal counterfeiting gang. Yes, that's another good point there where, yeah, the government is basically just – they're a legal counterfeiting organization essentially where they're just creating money that is not backed by anything. And in that way, as he pointed out, it's way more insidious too because unlike with a tax where you can see that you have money being taken from you – you might not um, be as likely to notice that when uh, the money that's being taken from you is uh, being taken from you by way of the dollar being devalued instead by more of it being created uh, with nothing behind it. As well, any government regulation as to what an owner may or may not do with his property beyond the rule that no one may physically damage the property of others and that all exchange and trade be voluntary and contractual implies the taking of somebody's property on a par with acts of extortion, robbery, or destruction. Right. So then, yeah, he's mentioning regulation as well, whereas uh, he, he would, I guess, he's making the distinction between regulation that kind of would be a law anyway, which is just anything that's saying that you cannot violate the property of others. Like that would at least mimic like what a private uh, solution would be for that, whereas any other regulation that they're making is going to be a violation of some owner's property. Um, but taxation, the government's provision for liquidity and government regulations, unlike their criminal equivalents, are considered legitimate, and the victim of government interference, unlike the victim of a crime, is not entitled to physically defend and protect his property. Right. Um, owing to their legitimacy, then, government violations of property rights affect individual time preferences in a systematically different and much more profound way than does crime. Like crime, all government interference with private property rights reduces someone's supply of present goods and thus raises his effective time preference rate. 
However, government offenses, unlike crime, simultaneously raise the time preference degree of actual and potential victims because they also imply a reduction in the supply of future goods, a reduced rate of return on investment. So he's kind of getting into that curve that we showed uh, way back in chapter one somewhere where you have um, you can have different time preferences at any given time, but then there's also like the degree of it where you, your entire curve gets shifted because when the government is violating your property, it's a permanent and expected thing. Yep. So you know that that violation of your property is just going to be constant forever. So you have to adjust permanently to that and heighten your time preference degree entirely mm -hmm. against that. Whereas if it was just a private uh, actor coming at you in a temporary situation, you would only have to adjust your time preference temporarily to defend against that or to shift your incentives against that, I should say. Um, crime. Crime, because it is illegitimate, occurs only intermittently. The robber disappears from the scene with his loot and leaves his victim alone. Thus, crime can be dealt with by increasing one's demand for protective goods and services relative to that for non-protection goods, so as to restore or even increase one's future rate of investment return and make it less likely that the same or a different robber will succeed a second time. In contrast, because they are legitimate, governmental property rights violations are continual. The offender does not disappear into hiding, but stays around, and the victim does not arm himself, but must, at least he is generally expected to, remain defenseless. The actual and potential victims of government property rights violations, as demonstrated by their continued defenselessness, vis-a-vis -vis their offenders respond by associating a permanently higher risk with all future production and systematically adjusting their expectations concerning the rate of return on all future investment downward. Yeah. So I guess um, what I should have said back there is that with the continual, uh, you know, government interference with it, where you're not like legitimately or legally entitled to defend yourself against it. What does happen is, um, you wind up having to uh, put more of your money into like other things than you would otherwise. Whereas with the temporary situation, you only do that temporarily. Like, oh, I'm going to just buy, you know, this gun or something to defend myself against this guy once or something. And I'll just have that forever. And, you know, the rest of the time, that money that I would have spent, you know, not buying that gun, I could, you know, the rest of the time, I'm not buying more guns. So I can spend that money on the productive things that I would be spending them on anyway. Whereas with the government, you're going to just shift what you're doing entirely because you're expecting to have less uh, in the future, basically, if that makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> I'm rambling. By simultaneously reducing the supply of present and expected future goods, governmental property rights violations not only raise time preference rates, but also time preference schedules. Because owner producers are defenseless against future victimization by government agents their expected rate of return on productive future oriented actions is reduced all around and accordingly all actual and potential victims become more present oriented yeah moreover because the degree of exploitation is comparatively higher under a publicly owned government this tendency towards present orientation will be significantly more pronounced as if the government is publicly owned than if it is owned privately all right, now we're into application, the transition from monarchy to democracy, 1789 to 1980, or 1918. Hereditary monarchies represent the historical example of privately owned governments and democratic republics that of publicly owned governments. Throughout most of its history, mankind, insofar as it was subject to any government control at all, was under monarchical rule. There were exceptions. Athenian democracy roamed during its Republican era until 31 B.C., the republics of Venice, Florence, and Genoa during the Re Renaissance period, and Swiss Canton since 1291. The United Provinces from 1648 until 1673, and England under Cromwell from 1649 until 1660. Yet these were rare occurrences in a world dominated by monarchies. With the exception of Switzerland, they were short-lived -lived phenomenon, constrained by monarchical surroundings. All older republics satisfied the open entry condition of public property only imperfectly for a while a republican form of government implies by definition that the government is not privately but publicly owned and a republic can thus be expected to possess an inherent tendency toward the adoption of universal suffrage 
In all of the early republics, entry into government was limited to relatively small groups of nobles. With the end of World War I, mankind truly left the monarchical age. In the course of one and a half centuries since the French Revolution, Europe and in its wake, the entire world, have undergone a fundamental transformation. Everywhere, monarchical rule and sovereign kings were replaced by democratic, republican rule and sovereign peoples. They real, real quick did want to touch on the idea that he was getting with universal suffrage. The point that he's kind of getting at is the the more people, if you get to a, like a pure democracy to where everyone is has is technically has a say, then yes, this is the full extent of like public uh, government that he's getting at. Whereas he's kind of making the point that when it first started out, they limited it, just like what we did with uh, the the United States. Uh, I guess I say we, but not really we, uh, like some people hundreds of years ago. But yeah. the idea was it was just landowners, it was like white men. Uh, you know, uh, they they were they were very restricted in who could vote. Uh, right, and everybody's going to vote, yeah, according to their own self interest. So when you open yeah. it up to like everybody, you have that, you know, the pe people are going to vote to get stuff basically and to take from the other people so yeah and, and, and theoretically if you think about it if in, in a situation with a king you essentially have one person who has say on things and the the more uh, it expands towards public the more people have say and theoretically that makes it i guess in a way worse it's almost like uh i prefer less people to vote so if it comes down right. to one I, I would i prefer zero people to vote but i would actually prefer one people to uh you know 350 million people voting so yes. yeah um all right. The first assault of republicanism and the idea of popular sovereignty on the dominating monarchical principle was repelled with the military defeat of Napoleon and the restoration of Bourbon rule in France. And as a result of the revolutionary terror and the Napoleonic Wars, republicanism was widely discredited for much of the 19th century. However, the democratic republican spirit of the French Revolution left a permanent imprint. From the restoration of the monarchical order in 1815 until the outbreak of World War I in 1914, all across Europe, popular political participation and representation was systematically expanded. The franchise was excessively widened, and the powers of popularly elected parliaments increased everywhere. I'm no history buff, but I do know for a fact that the French Revolution had a had a uh, had a lot to do with the stuff we were doing mm -hmm. over here in the states. So it, it definitely wasn't something that happened in a vacuum. Yeah, I don't know. Um, if you, did you skip that small paragraph with the end of World War One that? Uh... Like no, I read it. the French Revolution, but all right, fair enough. Because he, yeah. he made this point anyway in chapter one as well. But yeah, like the French Revolution was kind of one of the big turning points where you had um, sort of a democratic system of government uh, coming in there and, you know, like a monarchy being defeated there uh, in France. Yeah. And it's funny that the, it's like the French Revolution is held up as this great thing. But if you actually look into it, once again, I'm no history buff, you realize how pretty much pretty fucking retarded it, it resulted in the reign of terror and then napoleon yeah. took over after that so yeah it was a complete and utter shit show that like was just um just hell <laughs> like, yeah. and like yeah cool they killed some tyrants but it's like they also killed a lot of innocent people and yes. completely you know, plunged their country into shit mm -hmm. so, <laughs> from 1815 to 1830 the right to vote in france was still severely restricted under the restored bourbons yeah. Out of a population of some 30 million, the electorate included only France's very large property owners, about 100,000 people. As a result of the J July Revolution of 1830, the abdication of Charles X and the coronation of the Duke of Orleans, Louis Philippe, the number of voters increased to about 200,000. As a result of the revolutionary upheavals in, of 1848, France again turned Republican, and universal and unrestricted suffrage for all male citizens above the age of 21 was introduced. Napoleon III was elected by nearly 5.5 million votes out of an electorate of more than 8 million. Right. right. On to you. Yeah, and, yeah, and so all of that was after uh, the famous Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte had been defeated uh, in 1815, I believe. So all of that that you just mentioned happened after that. Uh, all right. In the United Kingdom, after 1815, the electorate consisted of some 500,000 well-to-do property owners, about 4% of the population above age 20. The Reform Bill of 1832 lowered the property owner requirements and extended the franchise to about 800,000. The next extension from about 1 million to 2 million came with the Second Reform Bill of 1867. In 1884, property restrictions were relaxed even further, and the electorate increased to about 6 million. <laughs> hey, 
almost a third of the population above age 20 and more than three fourths of all male adults. Yeah, definitely way too high. But go on. Uh, yes, way too high. So that was uh, the UK, their uh, transition to, yeah, having way more people being allowed to vote. In Prussia, as the most important of the 39 independent German states recognized after the Vienna, Con Vienna Congress, democratization set in with the Revolution of 1848 and the Constitution of 1850. The lower chamber of the Prussian parliament was hence elected by universal male suffrage. However, until 1918, the electorate remained stratified into three estates with different voting powers. For example, the wealthiest people, those who contributed a third of all taxes, elected a third of the members of the lower house. In 1867, the North German Confederation, including Prussia and 21 other German states, was founded. Its constitution provided for universal unrestricted suffrage for all males above the age of 25. In 1871, after the victory over Napoleon III, the constitution of the North German Confederation was essentially adopted by the newly founded German Empire. Out of a total population of around 35 million, nearly 8 million people, or about a third of the population over 20, elected the first German Reichstag. So, yeah, I don't know if we have anything to add to that. But that's, you know, he's kind of just going through the history of all the different uh, states here. So that was sort of Prussia's uh, transition into Germany and the German Empire. Yeah, it won't be a whole lot of commentary in the next couple of pages. It's mostly just history stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, after Italy's political unification under the leadership of the Kingdom of Sardinia and Piedmont in 1861, the vote was only given to about 500,000 people out of a population of some 25 million, about 3.5% of the population above age 20. In 1882, the property requirements were relaxed and the minimum voting age was lowered from 25 to 21 years. As a result, the Italian electorate increased to more than 2 million. In 1913, almost universal and unrestricted suffrage for all males above 30 and minimally restricted suffrage for males above 21 was introduced, raising the number of Italian voters to more than 8 million, more than 40% of the population above 20. Uh, yeah. And I guess I will just say that, you know, also like lowering the voting age is another thing you see that is the government's way of getting more and more people because they want these types of governments want to increase the voting base. Yeah. And, I like, you know, reading this and then sort of applying it to what we see current day in the U S like we see that happening all over the place. Like let's import all these people from different countries. You have Democrats wanting to lower the voting age to like 16 or something ridiculous. You can vote before you can smoke and drink. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. like, which is, it's still wild for me being like in my thirties that now they change the age of smoking to 21. <laughs> it's just like what, but whatever. Yeah. 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 Uh, in Austria, Restricted and unequal male suffrage was introduced in 1873. The electorate, com composed of four classes or curiae of unequal voting powers, totaled 1.2 million voters out of a population of about 20 million, 10% of the population above 20. In 1867, a fifth curia was added. 40 years later, the curia system was abolished and universal and equal suffrage for males above age 24 was adopted bringing the number of voters close to 6 million, almost 40% of the population above 20. Russia had elected provincial and district councils, Zemsvos, since 1864. And in 1905, as a fallout of its lost war against Japan, it created a parliament, the Duma, which was elected by near universal, although indirect and unequal male suffrage. As for Europe's minor powers, universal or almost universal and equal male suffrage has existed in Switzerland since 1848 and was adopted between 1890 and 1910 in Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Spain, Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Turkey. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. But no, yeah, not really. Going over, yeah, the increased suffrage in all of the different uh, European states. He's being thorough here. Although increasingly emasculated, I love his uh, use of words and some of these uh, sayings here, the monarchical principle dominated until the cataclysmic events of World War I. Before 1914, only two republics existed in Europe, France and Switzerland. 
And of all major European monarchies, only the United Kingdom could be classified as a parliamentary system. That is one in which supreme power was vested in an elected parliament. Only four years later, after the United States, where the democratic principle implied the idea of a republic, had only recently been carried to victory as a result of the destruction of the secessionist confederacy by the centralist union government, had entered the European war and decisively determined its outcome Monarchies had all but disappeared, and Europe turned to democratic republicanism. Yeah, so he mentioned this in the previous chapter, or maybe even the intro as well. Yeah, but he said it multiple times now. The the Confederacy, the the Civil War point, but right, he mentions yeah, the Civil War is a big turning point. And he continually points out that the Union, the Union government was a centralist government, which is true because they were uh, ultimately they were trying to prevent uh, the South from seceding, which was their constitutional right, even if. They were doing it for some bad reasons. Uh, yeah. The, of course, the result of that was definitely worse. A centralized government, and then that wound up leading to that sort of. Um, uh, I don't know what the word I'm like legitimized sort of the concept of a central kind of democracy uh, more mm -hmm. than anything had uh, in the U.S. prior to that, which then wound up leading to Wilson entering World War II with, I think, half of the war was already over at that point. It was this war between monarchies. He decides in World War One. Sorry, World War One. Yes, World War One. Of course, he um, decides. Uh, yeah, we're going to enter this when the U.S. had no business being in that war whatsoever, and his uh, he sold it as we're spreading democracy, you know, all over the world, basically making Europe safe for democracy or whatever the hell it was. Total yeah. bullshit. Um. All right. Where are we at here? Oh, in, in Europe. In Europe, the defeated Romanovs. Hohenzollerns and Habsburgs had to abdicate or resign, and Russia, Germany, and Austria became democratic republics with universal male and female suffrage and parliamentary governments. Likewise, all of the newly created successor states, Poland, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia, with the sole exception of Yugoslavia, adopted democratic republican constitutions. In Turkey and Greece, the monarchies were overthrown. Even where monarchies remain nominally in existence, as in Great Britain, Italy, Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, and the Scandinavian countries, monarchs no longer exercise any governing power. Universal adult suffrage was introduced, and all government power was invested in parliaments and public officials. A new world order, the democratic republican age, under the ages of a dominating U.S. government had begun. Yep. So, yeah, uh, he used the term New World Order there as well, which yep. uh, I kind of uh, enjoy. Yeah. Evidence and illustrations, exploitation and present-orientedness under monarchy and democratic republicanism. From the, review of from the viewpoint of economic theory, the end of World War I can be identified as the point in time at which private government ownership was completely replaced by public government ownership, and whence a systematic tendency toward increased exploitation, government growth, and rising degrees of social time preference, present orientedness can be expected to take off. Indeed, such has been the grand underlying theme of post-World War I Western history. With some forebodings in the last third of the 19th century in conjunction with an increased emasculation of the ancient regimes from 1918 onward, practically all indicators of governmental exploitation and of rising time preferences have exhibited a systematic upward tendency. Indicators of exploitation. There is no doubt that the amount of taxes imposed on civil society increased during the monarchical age. However, throughout the entire period, the share of government re revenue remained remarkably stable and low. Economic historian Carlo M. Sapola concludes, all in all, one must admit the portion of income drawn by the public sector all, uh, most certainly increased from the 11th century onward all over Europe. But it's difficult to imagine that, apart from particular times and places, the public power ever managed to draw more than 5 to 8% of national income. Yeah, so he's pointing out that uh, the monarchies, under the monarchies, it was much harder for the government to be able to grow itself. It was a very slow growth, if any at all, really. Yeah, I mean, they, they did say that the amount of taxes increased, but he's kind of getting the point oh, yeah, of the... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was yeah. a slow growth, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he said, but the share of government... Like, so the I guess the point being is that uh, uh, it's kind of the idea of the... Uh, 
uh, he's kind of getting out with the parasite where he they essentially they allow the the host to grow so that they can draw on it but they're able to draw more because if you're taking 10 percent of 300,000 as opposed to i don't know what's another number i'm thinking of like uh or 10 percent of or or even let's say 20 percent of 30 bucks like obviously there's a difference like right, so well, like yeah so I think what he's saying though is that the amount of taxes increased, but like the percentage uh, of the overall wealth of the population that was being confiscated by the government didn't increase as much as the amount did because the because the people were producing more and more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was more wealth to confiscate. So the percentage of that yeah. was yeah pretty stable. Yeah, essentially the, the point people yeah. the point was people were being more prosperous. So yes, while they were still taking a low percentage, they were getting kind of more you know comparatively speaking because people were more prosperous yeah um all right and he then goes on to note that this portion was not systematically exceeded until the second half of the 19th century in feudal times of observes bertrand de juvenile state expenditures as we now call them were thought of as the king's own expenditures which he incurred by virtue of his station when he came to his station he simultaneously simultaneously came into an estate he found himself endowed with property rights, ensuring an income adequate to the king's needs. It is somewhat as if a government of our own times were expected to cover its ex its ordinary expenditures from the proceeds of state-owned industries. In the course of the political centralization during the 16th and 17th centuries, additional sources of government revenue have been opened up. Customs, excise duties, and land taxes. However, up until the mid-19th century of all Western European countries, only the United Kingdom, for instance, had an income tax. Mm -hmm. France first introduced some form of income tax in 1873, Italy in 1877, Norway in 1892, the Netherlands in 1894, Austria in 1898, Sweden in 1903, the U.S. in 1913, Switzerland in 1916, Denmark and Finland in 1917, Ireland and Belgium in 1922, and Germany in 1924. Yet, even as at the time of the outbreak of World War I, total government expenditure as a percentage of GDP typically had not risen above, risen above 10% and only rarely, as in the case of Germany, exceeded 15%. In striking contrast, with the onset of the democratic Republican age, total government expenditures as a percentage of GDP typically increased to 20-30% to 30 in the course of the 1920s and 1930s. And by the mid 1970s, had generally reached 50%. Real quick, JC, thanks for the yes, five wow. bucks. Appreciate it. Like, oh, yeah, love, love seeing you popping up into these. Uh, oh, thanks yeah. for the support. Uh, right. Tower Power, our viewer as well. Yes. Uh, hell yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if there's too much to add to that, but yeah. Nah, the, uh, really. Yeah. The percentage of taxes, or yeah. So the income taxes were being introduced. The percentage um, of taxation was uh, increased uh, pretty dramatically uh, throughout. Uh, the course of these democratic governments existing where it hadn't increased that much prior to that. And he mentions uh, the U.S. introducing its um, permanent income tax, I would say, in 1913 under, of course, Woodrow Wilson, which uh, then was sort of uh, sort of want, the war kind of wound up being part of the excuse uh, to do that, I think so. And then uh, I believe that there was an income tax as well instituted during the Civil War, but it went away. Maybe I don't and then know. the one as we know it today was yeah introduced during uh, Wilson's uh, presidency. All right, there is also no doubt that total government employment increased during the monarchical age, but until the very end of the 19th century, government employment rarely exceeded three percent of the total labor force. Royal ministers and parliamentarians typically did not receive publicly funded salaries, but were expected to support themselves out of their private incomes. In contrast with the advances of the process of democratization, they became salaried officials. And since then, government employment has continually increased. In Austria, for instance, government employment as a percentage of the labor force increased from less than 3% in 1900 to more than 8% in the 1920s and almost 15% by the mid-1970s. In France, it rose from 3% in 1900 to 4% in 1920 and about 15% in the mid-1970s. In Germany, it grew from 5% in 1900 to close to 10% by the mid-1920s to close to 15% in the mid-1970s. 15% in the mid-1970s. 
In the United Kingdom, it increased from less than 3% in 1900 to more than 6% in the 1920s, and again close to 15% by the mid-1970s. The trend in Italy and almost everywhere else was similar, and by the mid-1970s, only in small Switzerland was government employment still somewhat less than 10% of the labor force. So he is saying that there were more government employees uh, under some monarchical regimes. However, in most of those cases, uh, they were sort of being paid like privately, I suppose is kind of what he's saying. Like maybe they were like hired by the king to do work and things of that nature. I don't know if that may be what he's talking about there, but um, as yeah, opposed think, to, yeah, go ahead. yeah, well, yeah, these democratic systems where there's – basically there isn't that barrier to entry anymore. So you have all these new people getting into government. But I, I do find it interesting that even still the percentage of people that are government employees is even though it's pretty insidious at this point, it's still somewhat low. Like the, I'm pretty certain that the number of non-government people, or at least people that are sort of a, uh, opposed to uh like the the rulers essentially i think that that amount of people i don't know how to phrase that but i think like the the ruled class is still much higher in numbers than the ruling class is what i'm trying to say here even like in the u.s right now yeah i don't know he said the 15 percent of the mid-1970s so that's over one in ten people are working in the government mm -hmm. and that's in the 70s so I'm sure it's probably upward near 20 now yeah, but, uh, but I'm also yeah. kind of like, I don't know, like, I mean, I think there are kind of like gray areas there as well, where yeah. it's like, well, do you really consider like some public school teacher in some really small town to really yeah. be a government employee? I mean, they get paid. Or the civilian like one contractor shirt. that mows right. the lawn of a military base or something. Yeah. Right. Or even like <laughs> a sheriff of a small town who might be, yeah. um, you know, pretty uh, down with like being like a constitutional type of guy and, you know, really only enforcing like private ownership and things like that. Yep. All right. All right. Um, a similar pattern emerges from an inspection of inflation and data on money supply. Yeah. The monarchical world was generally characterized by the existence of a commodity money, typically silver or gold. And at long last, after the establishment of a single integrated world market in the course of the 17th and 18th centuries by an international gold standard, a commodity money standard makes it difficult, if not impossible, for a government to inflate the money supply. In monopolizing the mint and engaging in coin flipping, kings did their best to enrich themselves at the expense of the public. There also had been attempts to introduce an irredeemable fiat currency. Indeed, the history of the Bank of England, for instance, from its inception in 1694 onward, was one of the periodic suspension of specie payment. In 1696, 1720, 1745, and from 1797 until 1821. But these fiat money experiments, associated in particular with the Bank of Amsterdam, the Bank of England, and John Law and the Banque Royale of France, had been regional curiosities, which ended quickly in financial disasters, such as the collapse of the Dutch tulip mania in 1637 and the Mississippi bubble and the South Sea bubble in 1720. As hard as they tried, monarchical rulers did not succeed in establishing monopolies of pure fiat currencies, i.e. of irredeemable government paper monies, which can be created virtually out of thin air at practically no cost. No particular individual, not even a king, could be trusted with an extraordinary monopoly such as this. So, yeah, there's kind of a lot in that paragraph. Um, yeah. Obviously, he's saying that monarchies were not able to get away with uh, creating fiat currency uh, like democratic governments are, where, as we point out time and time again, the Federal Reserve, and we use that Hoppe wave uh, Federal Reserve one uh, to intro this uh uh, episode here. Uh, Federal Reserve is obviously constantly creating money out of nothing, fiat currency, and uh, part of that has to do with the fact that there is no more gold standard, so there is you know, nothing backing that money anymore, so the government can kind of just do that in an out-of-control nature. Whereas, I guess, back when the monarchies existed, we did also have that like gold standard, and we, we did have those hard um, monies that existed, I think that and also just again the um, like those monarchies not being really seen as legitimate rulers, they could get away with less of this 
money creation and things like that. It, we have all of that kind of going on there. Yeah, I mean, really, and a lot of the other stuff that he talked on too about the incentives that come into the monarchy really does play into how it made it way harder for them to be able to get away with a fiat type thing. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know too much about the Dutch uh, tulip mania, really. I should like look I, into that more, but I know it was like considered to be one of the first like bubble burst scenarios, essentially. So I assume it had something to do with some sort of fiat currency experiment, which he's kind of yeah. saying here, but I don't know too much about that. Yep. Um, and of course, people use it as a, a damning indictment of capitalism. Oh, no. Which is not actually the case. Uh, it was only under conditions of democratic republicanism of anonymous and impersonal rule that this feat was accomplished. During World War I, as during earlier wars, the belligerent governments had gone off the gold standard. Everywhere in Europe, the result was a dramatic increase in the supply of paper money. In defeated Germany, Austria, and Soviet Russia, in particular, hyperinflationary conditions ensued in the immediate aftermath of the war. Unlike earlier wars, however, World War I did not conclude with a return to the gold standard. Instead, from the mid-1920s until 1971, and interrupted by a series of international monetary crises, a pseudo-gold standard, the gold exchange standard, was implemented. Essentially, only the U.S. would redeem dollars and gold, and from 1933 on, after going off the gold standard domestically, only to foreign central banks. Britain would redeem pounds and dollars, or rarely, in gold bullion rather than gold coin. And the rest of Europe would redeem their currencies in pounds. Consequently, as a reflection of the international power hierarchy, which had come into existence by the end of World War I, the U.S. government now inflated paper dollars on top of gold, Britain inflated pounds on top of inflating dollars, and the other European, current, other European countries inflated their paper currencies on top of inflating dollars or pounds, and after 1945, only dollars. Finally, in 1971, with ever larger dollar reserves accumulated in European central banks and the imminent danger of a European run on the U.S. gold reserves, even the last remnant of the international gold standard was abolished. Since then, and for the first time in history, the entire world has adopted a pure fiat money system of freely fluctuating government paper currencies. Yep. So there was yeah, a lot of uh, the history of currency and banking kind of in that one paragraph there. But he is pointing out that, yes, yeah, so the U.S. Uh, went off the gold. Well, first they created the Federal Reserve again under Woodrow Wilson, uh, which I believe was also in 1913 or somewhere around there. So they started uh, that paper money printing that we're familiar with today. Um, they were doing that. Then uh, the U.S. went off the, uh, the gold standard. So the, the money was not uh, actually backed by gold anymore. And I know that uh, under FDR, as I think uh, Papa mentioned here, they uh, made it illegal to own gold anymore in the U.S. So it was essentially confiscated from the public at that point in 1933 or whatever. Um, which was yeah during the depression as well um then uh there was the pseudo gold standard that existed uh from whatever like in the 1920s or whatever up until 1971 which was the gold exchange which was even though uh private citizens could no longer uh, own gold uh the dollar was in a way sort of still backed by gold just in that foreign countries could still exchange their gold for the u.s dollar then in 1971, the U.S. realized that that was going to be unsustainable because the uh, all those countries had so much gold. Uh, the U.S. was afraid that there was going to be a run on the central bank, I guess, or on the U.S. gold reserves, uh, the uh, or on the U.S. Uh, what on the currency? I, f I forget on the currency reserve, I guess. Right? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't recall specifically. I'm trying to remember now, but whatever yeah. it was, yeah. So they went off the gold exchange, so um, money was no longer even uh, redeemable, uh, or gold was no longer redeemable for money anymore. Am I getting that backwards? Something like that. I, I don't recall. I, I know essentially they just got to the point to where it's just completely paper money that's not backed up by anything. Right. So in 1971, that was the Bretton Woods uh, agreement, and uh, yeah, that's when the – last remnants of the gold standard went away completely. And that's when you saw inflation just completely spike and go out of control. Money printing just went out of control. Yeah. It was what I said in the first place, I think was the case. It was that the, these foreign uh, 
governments still all had this gold and they're like, hey, we can redeem this uh, for US dollars. And the US was like, well, we can't sustain this anymore, right? Yeah. Some, something to that effect, I think. And the US dollar is still the uh, re foreign reserve currency. So other currencies are still all redeemable uh, for US dollars, I believe. So that's kind of how the US dollar is still being like propped up to some extent in this case. But it's like, I don't know. I I'm no expert on this. Uh, yeah. We should uh, we should get Clint on. Yeah. As a result, from the beginning of the Democratic Republican age, initially under a pseudo gold standard and an accelerated pace since 1971 under a government paper money standard, a seemingly permanent secular tendency toward inflation and currency depreciation has existed. During the monarchical age with commodity money largely outside of government control, the level of prices had generally fallen and the purchasing power of money increased, except during times of war or new gold discoveries. Various price in indices for Britain, for example, indicate that prices were substantially lower in 1760 than they had been hundreds uh, had been a hundred years earlier. And in 1860, they were lower than they had been in 1760. Connected by an international gold standard, the development in other countries was similar. In sharp contrast, during the Democratic Republican age, with the World Financial Center shifted from Britain to the U.S. and the latter in the role of an international monetary trendsetter, a very different pattern emerged. Before World War I, the U.S. index of wholesale commodity prices had fallen from 125 after the end of the war between the states. In 1868 to below 80 in 1914, it was then lower than it had been in 1800. In contrast, shortly after World War I in 1921, the U.S. Wholesale Commodity Price Index stood at 113. After World War II in 1948, it had risen to 185. In 1971, it was 255. By 1981, it reached 658. And in 1991, it was near 1,000. During only two decades of irredeemable fiat money, the consumer price index in the U.S. rose from 40 in 1971 to 136 in 1991. In the U.K., it climbed from 24 to 157. In France, from 30 to 137. And in Germany, from 56 to 116. And I do like how this does point out how insidious fucking fiat currency is because mm. it really does break down how prices were dropping and your purchasing power increased and fiat just like did the exact opposite so uh yeah obviously our money system and you know the governments that we had before weren't perfect uh yeah. you know like we've making the case multiple times that we're not saying that monarchy is ideal it's just preferable uh but it so it still had negative consequences but you know, going the essentially this fiat thing was only allowed by essentially the world becoming like a democracy, and that it it got real bad real quick. And I think we're about to get a debt in a second, and that'll that'll make it even more clear. Right. The the main point that he made there was just that yeah, with the uh, creation of fiat currency, uh, creating all that uh, supply of currency reduces the value of that currency and increases prices, and that's what we saw. Whereas with the monarchies, we did not see very much of that uh where yeah. everything became way more expensive and i think i did reverse the uh, gold thing by the way i think it was that foreign countries had us dollars and they were still allowed to exchange them for the us gold or for gold that was in the us gold reserves up until the us was like oh shit, we don't have enough gold anymore to uh, you know account for all of this so then they had to just go off that completely i think that's what happened Similarly, during more than 70 years from 1845 until the end of World War I in 1980, the British money supply had increased about sixfold. In distinct contrast, during the 73 years from 1980 till 1991 or 1918 till 1991, the U.S. money supply increased more than 64-fold. Mm -hmm. In addition to taxation and inflation, a government can resort to debt in order to finance its current expenditures. As with taxation and inflation, there is no doubt that government debt increased in the course of the monarchical age. However, as predicted theoretically, in this field, monarchs also showed considerably more moderation and farsightedness than democratic republican caretakers. Throughout the monarchical age, government debts were essentially war debts. While the total debt thereby tended to increase over time, during peacetime, at least monarch monarchs characteristically reduced their debts. The British example is fairly representative. In the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, 
Government debt increased. It was 76 million pounds after the Spanish War in 1748, 127 million after the Seven Years' War in 1763, 232 after the American War of Independence in 1783, and 900 million after the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. During e yet during each pe uh, peacetime period from 1727 to 1739, from 1748 to 1756, and from 1762 to 1775, total debt actually decreased. From 1815 until 1940, the British national debt fell from a total of 900 to below 700 million pounds. And we're, I think he's going to you know, expand on the debt thing more, but the, the, the point being is like all these economic things, it, it, these are pretty wild to, to read actually from a modern day perspective and what our money does. Like obviously we talked yeah. about inflation and like the, the purchasing power of your dollar. Uh, and now we're talking about debt and it's uh, like, it is, it is, it is almost just an, it has been assumed for decades now that just like, we're not paying the shit off. And right. like, and the idea that it, like, if anything, it's just more like, Oh, we're the idea is to hopefully keep it in a, manageable spot like and even that we're not even doing like that's yeah but, that is the the yeah. debt is so out of control at this point with the u.s i think it's it's got to be in like the 30 yeah. trillions maybe at this point the overall uh u.s government debt and there's no way they're ever going to pay that yeah. back so this is money that they owe different countries i think they owe a lot to china and all this other shit and yeah like the only way that the u.s is going to be able to get out of that is to default on the debt yeah. Whereas they, the point they're making is they actually, in, in under the monarchical age, actually used to pay that shit off. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe not completely, right. but they would, you know, while they were at pe like times of peace, right. they would reduce it substantially. And we're right. And the U.S. More. is never at peace. It's constant yeah. wartime, literally. So yeah. Yeah. So they don't even they don't have the peace time yet in order to pay off uh, all the debts that they accumulate in wartime either. So it's yeah. Yeah. It's just constant war and constant debt. Yep. In striking contrast, since the onset of the Democratic Republican age, British debt has only increased in war and in peace. In 1920, it was 7.9 billion pounds. In 1838, eight, or 1938, 8.3 billion. In 1945, 20 point, or 22.4 billion. In 1970, 34 billion. And since then, it has skyrocketed more than 190 billion pounds in 1987. Likewise, U.S. government debt has increased through war and peace. Federal government debt after World War I in 1919 was about $25 billion. In 1940, it was $43 billion. And after World War II in 1946, it stood at about $270 billion. By 1970, it had risen to $370 billion. And since 1971, under a pure fiat money regime, it has literally exploded. In 1979, it was about $840 billion. And in 1985, more than 1.8 trillion. In 1988, it reached almost 2.5 trillion. By 1992, it exceeded 3 trillion. And presently, it, stand, it stands at uh, approximately 6 trillion. Yeah, Obviously, it's, it's changed since then. But, yeah, it's but. hilarious to read that now because this was uh, whatever, like 2000, somewhere around there. Yeah. And this is, he's talking about the U.S. national debt, right? It's 6 trillion yeah. at that point, and it's now above 30. Yeah. All right, uh, on to you. Uh, let's let's uh, let's end at the uh, end of the. Uh, I guess I probably could just finish up, but the the, the juvenile. But I'll at the end of the it. end of the de juvenile quote here. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Uh, it might be a weird transition on the next episode, but I think that's all right. All right. Um, finally, the same tendency toward increased exploitation and present orientation emerges upon examination of government leg legislation and regulation. During the monarchical age, with a clear-cut distinction between the ruler and the ruled, the king and his parliament were held to be under the law. They applied pre-existing law as judge or jury. They did not make law. Writes Bertrand de Juvenel, the monarch was looked on only as judge and not as legislator. He made subjective rights respected and respected them himself. He found these rights... He found these rights in being and did not dispute that they were anterior to his authority. Subjective rights were not held on the precarious tenure of grant, but were freehold possessions. The sovereign's right was also a freehold. It was a, sub, it was a subjective right as much as the other rights, though of a more elevated dignity, but it could not take the other rights away. Indeed, there was a deep-seated feeling that all positive rights stood or fell together, if the king disregarded a private citizen's title to his land, so might the king's title to his throne be disregarded. 
The profound, if, if obscure, concept of legitimacy established the solidarity of all rights. No change in these rights could be affected without the consent of their holders. Yep, and I guess the next episode we'll probably expound more on this concept. Right. So just touched on it. Yeah. So in the monarchical age, he's saying that uh, private property was more respected. Essentially, yep. is a, a very long way of saying that. With that quote yep. there from De Juvenal. Yep. Well, all right. Let's uh, let's get out of here. You want to drop your plugs, Toad? Yeah. Uh, Tph underscore Toad on Twitter and uh, hoping to get my old account back. I, I have a. Um, an appeal in progress right now. And I haven't heard back in three days. So I don't know if that's a good sign or not. I haven't even bothered to appeal. I was going to wait till like account started coming back. And then I might reappeal again, again, but right now, yeah, they just haven't given me a reply, which is not the same thing as when they, uh, when I appealed uh, like the first time, like they immediately came back with a response. So uh, I, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's not, but hopefully I'll get it back. TPH underscore toad for now, at least on Twitter and tower power. We are live every Wednesday night at 9, 11 p.m. Eastern. We do offensive comedy, and we're all libertarians. And um, we did an episode last night with Adam Nutter and got a little bit wild, I think, as they tend to do. And we're coming up on uh, episode 100, I think, on December 7th. So yep. I don't know if we're going to be doing something big for that or not. But we're, we're trying to get some more guests here, some cool guests, and yep. see where we go with that. Well, uh, I'm Jose Galison, and this is No Way Jose Show. You can find me on YouTube, all the major art buggers, Aussie as well. Follow me on Twitter at Senor Jose 2020. Uh, if you want to follow me, you can do me on Facebook as well, Jose Galison. If you want to support me, Patreon.com, just No Way Jose 2020. Please help support these. If you like these, this content, please share it around. Like, share, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. With that we are out. Good night, boys. Good night, Eddie Grimm. Good night, JC. Thanks to everyone who showed up. Peace uh, out. We are out of here. <laughs>